to do a one sample t-test for the mean. So here we're going to be um, looking at a, comp the, at a hypothesis test for the mean. So recall in the problem that you just um, should have done, the 90% confidence interval, that adults need between seven and nine hours of sleep. Do students at this college get what they need? And can we say that the mean amount of its student sleep is at least seven hours? A question like this um, is calls for a hypothesis test. And that test is called a one sample t test for the mean. So like any um, hypothesis test, we're always going to look for the hypotheses. We're gonna check our conditions. We're going to do our calculations, which includes creating a sketch. We're going to make a decision about our p-value, uh, whether we're gonna reject or not reject the null, and then um, interpret what that means. Researchers tested 150 farm-raised salmon for organic contaminants. They found the mean concentration of the carcinogenic insecticide Murex to be 0 0.0913 parts per million, with a standard deviation of 0 0.0495 parts per million. As a safety recommendation to recreational fishers, the Environmental Protection Agency's recommended screening value for Murex is 0 0.08 parts per million. Our farm salmon contaminated beyond the level permitted by the EPA. Okay, so in order to determine this, we need evidence and we need to um, do a hypothesis test. So for your hypothesis test, remember we don't have P, we're dealing with means, so that's mu. And the hypotheses will always um, refer to the population parameter. So here we know that the population parameter um, is 0 0.08, okay? And the alternative here, since we're looking at the question, are farm salmon contaminated beyond the level permitted by the EPA, we wanna look at is the mean amount greater than 0 0.08. Okay, I wanna check my conditions. So um, the salmon should be independent of each other. Um, it doesn't say that it's a random sample. However, probably with that large of a sample size, it's safe to say that those farm-raised salmon are representative of all salmon. Um, we know that 150 salmon is less than 10% of the entire population of salmon. And since we have a large enough sample size, we can say that um, if we were to graph it, the histogram would be more than likely unimodal and symmetric. Okay, so step three, let's write out um, our calculations and the statistics that we have. So we know our sample mean here, they tell us, is 0 0.0913, so that's Y bar. And when I find my standard error, remember I don't know sigma, but I do know S. And S here is 0 0.0495. And then I'm going to divide by that by the square root of 150. And when you do that dividing, you end up with 0 0.0040. I know that my degrees of freedom we calculated before is n minus one, so it's 149, okay? So I'm looking here for my t test statistic, and that's gonna be my x bar, which is point, or y bar, sorry, your book uses y bar, same thing though, 0 0.0913 minus mu, which is 0 0.08, and then divided by the standard error we found, which was 0 0.0040. And when you do this, you get 2.83. So when I create my T model, right, not normal model, but the T model with 149 degrees of freedom, I know that my mean is going to go in the middle, which is 0 0.08. And then we would go three standard deviations in either direction. 2.83 tells me I'm going to be 2.83 standard deviations um, above the mean. And since I'm dealing with greater, I'm going to be shading to the right. So what I'm looking for here is the probability that T is greater than 2.83. Okay, so what I need to do 
is I need to go to a new function on the calculator. It's called TCDF. And you can find it where you find the um, normal CDF. So you're just gonna go to second vars and you're gonna click on number six, which is TCDF. And it asks for the um, lower and then the upper and your degrees of freedom. So I'm gonna delete this. Okay, my lower bound would be my T um, test statistic, which was 2.83. My upper bound, we could just make it like 100. And the difference here is it doesn't ask for the mean and standard deviation, but it asks for the degrees of freedom. And here, my degrees of freedom is 149. Okay, and then hit enter, and we get 0 0.0026. So that's my p-value. Okay, so again, we used 2.83, 100, and then your degrees of freedom. And we got 0 0.0026. So that tells me for my um, decision and my interpretation that since my p-value is less than my alpha level, which is 0 0.05, right? That's the default alpha level. We're going to reject the null. Okay, and since we're rejecting the null, what does that mean? That means that there is strong evidence to suggest what? So we need to go back to the alternative to suggest that the mean um, contaminated amount is, um, it, or the mean contaminated amount is beyond the level permitted by the EPA. So the mean contaminated amount is beyond the permitted level. of the EPA. You can try the next problem on your own. Um, you wanna go through the different um, steps and you will end up at the end not rejecting H0 if you do it correctly. And remember when you when you do not reject you say there is not strong evidence. And then you mention the alternative hypothesis in context there. So try that, see what you get. Um and we're going to move on. Okay. So how is the confidence level related to the p-value? To be precise, a level C confidence interval contains all the plausible null hypothesis values that would not be rejected if you use a two-sided p-value of one minus the confidence level. So if my confidence level was 95%, one minus 0.95 is 0 0.05, right? That's the cutoff for deciding to reject H0. So that's why our alpha level is 0 0.05 um, when we do a hypothesis test, but my confidence interval is 95% um, for the confidence level. Confidence intervals are naturally two-sided, so they correspond to two-sided p-values. When, as in our example, the hypothesis is one-sided, the interval contains values that would not be rejecting using a cutoff p-value of one minus the confidence level divided by two. Confidence intervals in the hypothesis test look at the same problem from two different perspectives. A hypothesis test um, starts with a proposed parameter value and asks if the data are consistent with that value. If the observed statistic is too far from the proposed parameter value, that makes it less plausible that the proposed value is the truth. So, of course, we end up rejecting the null hypothesis. By contrast, a confidence interval 
starts with the data and finds an interval of plausible values for where the parameter may lie. And remember, that goes back to um, if, you know, the 90% confidence interval for the mean number of sleep hours was this, okay, which breaks down to this. If someone hypothesized that the mean sleep amount was really eight hours, well, eight's not in my interval, right? Um, but it's not unlikely or surprising because it's not that far away from your interval um, to be unrealistic or improbable. Remember, if you're taking one sample, you know, you could take another sample where maybe eight is included. Um, however, depending on your, um, you know, your hypothesis check, uh, test, you know, you would probably have ended up rejecting the null there because eight was not in your interval. All right, so I'm going to skip this um, question right here. Um, you know, I'll have you answer that one. The last thing I'm going to look at here is choosing the sample size. So how large a sample do we really need? Um, the simplest answer is more. Sample size calculations are never exact, but it's always a good idea to know whether your sample size is large enough to give you a good chance of being able to tell you what you want to know before you collect your data. So here's an example. A company claims its program will allow your computer to download movies quickly. We'll test the free evaluation copy by downloading a movie several times, hoping to estimate the mean download time with a margin of error of only eight minutes. We think the standard deviation of download times is about 10 minutes. How many trial downloads must we run if we want 95% confidence in our estimate with a margin of error of only eight minutes. Okay, so if we're dealing with 95%, right, there's a couple things here. Um, I don't know the sample size, so I can't find degrees of freedom, right? Because degrees of freedom is N minus one, and N is the sample size. That's what I'm actually looking for. So we have to be creative here. We're actually gonna use Z star. And remember, Z star for 95% is 1.96, but we're just gonna use two because um, when you're looking at the empirical rule, right, 95% of the data falls within two standard deviations of the mean. So it's safe to estimate using two. And if you'll remember, the margin of error formula is just um, your T critical value, degrees of freedom, times the standard error of Y bar. Okay, again, we don't know the T critical value because we don't know the degrees of freedom. So instead, we're gonna just use our Z star. Okay, for now, and let's see what we get. So the margin of error, it says, needs to be eight. Um, and we're gonna use T for, or two for T star. And the standard error is gonna be my S divided by the square root of N, which I'm looking for, I'm trying to find N. So all I'm gonna do is multiply two times 10, which is 20. So I get eight equals 20 divided by the square root of N. Okay, and to solve for n, you can do a couple things. You can multiply both sides by the square root of n, or you can cross multiply. You would get eight times the square root of n equals 20 times one. And then I'm trying to find n, so I'm gonna divide both sides by eight. And to undo a square, um, a square root, I'm gonna square both sides. The square root of n squared is just n. And if I do 20 squared divided by eight squared, or take 20 divided by eight and square it, you get 6.25. So that's a very small sample, okay? That's probably not gonna be big enough. So what we're gonna do then is we're gonna use this information to then find our degrees of freedom. Okay, and we know degrees of freedom is found using sample size minus one. So here we'll just pretend it's six, just for the sake of easiness. Six minus one is five. So let's pretend our degrees of freedom is five. Now we can find T critical value with five degrees of freedom, okay? So how do I do that for um, uh, a confidence interval? Let's go to my T table. 
Okay, and I'm dealing with 95% um, confidence, right? So I want to look at this column, and you've got your degrees of freedom is 5. So my T critical value is going to be 2.571. So let's try using that. So I'm going to do the same thing now, 8 equals, and in place of the 2, I'm going to put 2.571 this time, and then it's going to be over um, 10 over the square root of n. Okay, this time I'm going to multiply 2.571 times 10, and of course you get 8 equals 25.71 over the square root of n. And then I'm going to basically just crisscross uh, applesauce, so multiply both sides, I get 8 square root of n equals 25.71, and then I'm going to divide both sides by 8, and then we're going to square both sides to undo the radical, and when you do that, you get 10.33. And remember, we always want to round up. So the sample size we would need, the minimum sample size we would need is about 11. So we would need to do 11 downloads here, um, trial downloads, if we want to run at 95% confidence with the margin of error of only eight minutes. And that's it for this video. Um, please let me know if you have any questions. I hope you all enjoy the rest of your day.